of SciShow Tangents, the lightly competitive science knowledge showcase. I'm your host, Hank Green, and joining me this week, as always, is our science expert, Sari Riley. Hello. And our resident everyman, Sam Schultz. Hello. I have a piece of uh, a, a update you may have heard in our, in our credits. We talk about Faith Schmidt. Faith is going by Eve now. My grandfather did this too. And actually, my parents said this to me as I was going to college. They were like, your grandfather changed his name. He like went, start, stopped going by his middle name and went by his first name when he went off to, to college. So you can totally be Bill or Will or Willie or William or whatever you want when you go off to college. Like, And I was like, no, I love my name. And that's weird that you would think that I would, hey, would want to do that. But it's always an option. Sam, who would you b- become? <sighs> well, I don't... I don't like my name very much. And I'm, I'm, no? I've gone on record as saying this. I've never been able to think of a better one, but one time I asked David Sedaris. You want me to call you should... Schultzy? No. One time I asked David Sedaris <laughs> what I should change my name to, and David Sedaris oh. said I should be S. Douglas Schultz. I think that's pretty good, <gasps> right? S. Douglas. Is Douglas that's your middle great. name? Douglas is my middle name. I could be Doug, but yeah. I don't feel like a Doug. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I'm a dog. I'm looking at you and I don't see a dog. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Maybe when you're like 70, you could be a Doug. A Doug, old Dougie. What do you think my name should be? I don't know. Dougie might be all right. Dougie. I'm not a dog, but I am a Dougie. <laughs> you're more of a Dougie. <laughs> <laughs> That's a fun name. My wife has a theory that all men are either a Dan, a Danny, or a Daniel. Oh. Everybody's one of those. I think yeah. I'd be a, mm-hmm. I think, I don't know. I'm a Danny trending Dan. I think I wouldn't be a Daniel. Yeah, I think so. Your sun sign is is Danny. And your <laughs> rising yeah. is Dan. I'm a I'm rising. I'm worried Dan. that I might I might have ended up a Daniel. No, you're a Dan. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Dan, Dan I Green. I think that. Daniel is the one who started twenty businesses. Yeah, but mm-hmm. you're Dan. But Dan is the one who runs them. Yeah, and then Danny is like uh, the one who humped that fish. <laughs> 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 we all, all of us contain three wolves. <laughs> Dan, Daniel, yeah. and Danny. <laughs> um, Sarah, what do you think? Sarah, you have such a great name, but I don't know. Mm, where are you at? Yeah, well, I hated my name because uh, no teacher could pronounce it. Because the full the full name is? Saridwin. Is that what they didn't like? Either. Either oh, they okay. couldn't do it. A lot of it was Carrie. A lot of it was mm. Sari. Now that the iPhone mm-hmm. came out, Siri was a big one. Siri. But also, there were just so many weird permutations. I got, like, my full name was Gerwin once. I got Gary because people just misread the C as a G because for some reason that was more legible. Gerwin? Um, this is what somebody yep. called you? That's great. Someone called me Gerwin, I and I hated it. I think you should be it. Gerwin. <laughs> it was during no. a school assembly when I won some uh. sort of, like, sixth grade <laughs> award Gerwin. for being a good student. And then they called up Gerwin. Riley and I was like, that simply can't be me. That's simply <laughs> not me. That simply can't be. And then my teacher was like, I think it's you. And I was like, Mr. Frank, it cannot be me. And then they I cried a little Gerwin. going up. <laughs> <laughs> don't call me um, Gerwin from now on. <laughs> please don't. But so I sincere, I, I seriously thought about changing the pronunciation to Carrie when mm, I went okay. to college. I was like, now's a like a, a fresh start, similar similar thing. I wasn't prompted by anyone, but I was like, I could just switch it to Carrie, and it would be so much easier for everyone. I think I I think I could have pulled off Will. I think I could have lived as a Will. Yeah, I think so too. Yeah. So we we've got S. Douglas, Carrie, and Will here <laughs> for your episode of Sideshow. <laughs> Ew! What a weird <laughs> alternate reality we've created. I'd prefer S- to go under a pseudonym. Uh, if you're watching the video podcast, this is not Sari Riley. This is. <laughs> Some, some other person. This is a yeah, slime Ka- monster here. Yeah, Carrie just so ran a, a full mile in dress clothes to get here slightly after time because the trains broke. Ah, you could have pretended like she was on time instead of saying she was slightly after time. <laughs> she didn't even make it. <laughs> yeah. I just made it by running. No, I was late. Well, it's not easy to make mass transit work. Is what I've heard. I'm glad it's not my job. Every week here on SciShow Tangents, we get together to try to one-up a maze and delight each other with science facts while also trying to stay on topic. Our panelists are playing for glory and for Hank Bucks, which I will be awarding as we play. And at the end of the episode, one of you two will be crowned the winner. Now, as always, we're going to introduce this week's topic with the traditional science poem this week from Sam. Got a baby chicken that needs securing? I think a shell would work quite well. A mollusk in need of a home that's enduring. I think a shell would work quite well. A turtle that wants to not get ate? 
I think a shell would work quite well. A nautilus that doesn't want to be shark bait. I think a shell would work quite well. <laughs> a chocolate candy you don't want melting. I think a shell would work quite well. A shrimp that needs mm. to take a pelting. I think a shell would work quite well. So if you've got the chitin to spare and you need some protectin for your derriere, by now I think you should be able to tell that a shell would work quite well. That's cute! I love that one. The topic for the day is shells, which Sam has gone ahead and explored the reality that it's there's a a wide variety. I had not considered the candy shell, but now I am thinking about them and they, I love them. No, I searched things with a shell. One of them was a coconut. One of them was an M&M. So, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Both are so, true. Terry, what's a shell? Is this a hard outside? Yeah, I think that's <laughs> it. It's a hard a hard casing or covering in in some sort and they can be made out of all kinds of things you can have chocolate shell you can have one made of mm-hmm. uh plant matter in the case of a coconut or like a seed yeah. the, the yeah. husk or the hole is also sometimes called a shell you shell a pistachio there are plenty of calcium based shells um so like mollusk shells are generally some form of calcium carbonate secreted to, f- to form those structures. Sam mentioned chitin, which is a lot of crustacean shells are made of that. Shells can be keratin uh, in the case of um, like a, I think an armadillo. Those the are fingernail like stuff. Hairs and shells. Yeah. Yeah. The fingernail and, and hair stuff. Do my fingers have shells? Uh, I think they do. I think they little do. Little shell? Finger shells. Yeah. Because yeah. they're definitely, they're much more like shells than nails. Is your skull a, sh- a shell of a type? Because it has you a can't brain have in an it. interior shell. Can't you though? Some octopuses have made their shells into their bones, right? Yeah, but you don't call them shells anymore. I think there's something exterior to a shell. Because because a turtle shell is made of bone, but it's more mm-hmm. out than it okay. is. Yeah. What if you had a skull out of the head that still had a brain in it? <laughs> then would it be a shell? If your skull was like a little umbrella over your head. Like a hat, if your skull was a hat. And it could go, mm-hmm, like that. I've seen some, okay. I've seen some characters in science fiction with this. Yeah, a Frankenstein kind of situation. I don't know how he made his head so flat. <laughs> I don't either. He was made out of other guys. Did he find a guy with a big flat head? Yeah, well, he used a normal head for that. This would be the perfect flat head. Yeah, they could have packed extra flesh on too, kind of like built it up. Have you ever done pottery? You make mistakes all the time. <laughs> You're just squishing on. Oh, yeah. Frankenstein. Dr. Frankenstein just kept messing up. And he was like, uh, OK, I'll cover that. Yeah. Up. Let me just add a little bit more there and I'll make it <laughs> yeah. look. It's fine. That's probably what happened. The other shells that came up when I was looking this up in relation to science is electron shells, which are oh. uh, like the, the layers, the energy levels that are mostly just helpful tools for us to picture. Like the word electron shell is more of a. More of a concept. Than okay. like a an actual thing that you could hide under to protect yourself with. <laughs> if you were tiny, tiny, maybe. It's still a use of the word shell to mean a kind of casing. Hmm. But mm-hmm. in this case, a much more metaphorical or visual aid as opposed to an egg that you can pick up. Yeah, it, that's not a shell. That's just an idea that we needed a word for. And boy, do I not want to talk about electron shells. Yeah. I've done it enough <laughs> in my I life. wanted to mention it so we didn't get called out, but I also do not want to try and define <laughs> an electron shell because I feel like I'll just get in trouble from the, the real chemists or That's the right. quantum physicists. The science police will come after you. Yeah, they're not even chemists, those folks. <laughs> <laughs> And do we know anything about this word? The the origins of the word shell are just as varied as the many uses of it nowadays, where we just needed a word for something, and we use the word shell or the root word of it, um, which is the Proto-Indo-European skel, S-K-E-L, um, which does mm-hmm. not inform skeleton, but is more oh. like scale or shale mm-hmm. or right. or shell. And so we used it for anything 
that kind of had a scale or a rind or a bark or an outside thing, both in the the like a hard outer co- covering that you saw in nature as you were cooking. And then when you were specifying like shells on the beach, all of those you used a very specific word. So you'd say there's a cockle shell or a mussel shell or an oyster mm-hmm. shell or a scallop shell in the same way that we still call out those specific organisms when we're talking about their specific shells. But Mm -hmm. I think nowadays there's a connotation of when people think of shell, maybe one of the first thing they think of is like seashell in general. But back then it was very much like it's an outside thing. You could call any outside thing that you needed to remove or deal with a shell. I've looked this up and skull is actually related to shell. So maybe the skull is a shell, at least etymologically. So boom, well done, Sam. Once what again, a champion. Right. Well, here's the thing. Check this mm. out. If you have a candy shell, but it's cold, and then you do a chocolate shell on top of it, that's now a chocolate candy shell. That's like what the skull is. But instead of, yep. you've got like the, the candy shell is the skull, now. and then the chocolate on top is the skin. Right. Yeah. Not an effective. It's like shell a, it's like a kind of a goopy tea. outer layer. <laughs> yeah. So it's more okay. like a, a candy shell with hot fudge on top because that's, that's oh, good. Sure, yeah. It's more not goopy, two shells. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a candy shell with hot fudge on it. And I if I was a giant and I ate people's heads, I'd probably think of it as ha- like a having a shell. What a little treat! A little crunch to it. It would crunch. Maybe that's the new definition of shell. If it crunches, it's a shell. That was already the definition of crust. So that can't be the definition <laughs> of shell. <too. laughs> this is why we're not in charge of defining words. I'm so happy for <laughs> mm-hmm. that fact. And since now I think I mostly know what a shell is, it's time to move on to the quiz portion of our show. This week, we're going to be playing Shell's Truth or Fail. There are many peculiar things going on in our universe that involve shells, but... Only some of the things that we think about with shells can actually be achieved. So today we're going to be playing Truth or Fail Shell Edition. There's three stories featuring shells. Only one of them is true. It's up to you to figure (laughs) out which one is true. It could be story number one. Scientists developed an app called Snail Snap that allows people to upload pictures of snails so that researchers could learn more about how the color of snail shells is changing depending on their location. So it's like Snapchat, but it's just snails. Snail. 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 Or it could be story number two. Astronomers are studying exoplanets and have found a rare type of exoplanet that they call conch planets because their winds run in a distinct cycle that stirs rocks on the surface into a spiral pattern similar to the spire on conch shells. Or it could be fact number three. Archaeologists were using a CT scan to study the wrappings of an Egyptian mummy when they found a layer containing an elaborate design made with shells of large foraminifera, a type of amoeboid protist. So is it Snail Snap, story number one, an app that lets users help snails take their shelfies, or story number two, a rare exoplanet uh, that's been Uh, found to have distinctive spirals similar to a conch shell, or story number three, Egyptian mummies wore amoeba shell jewelry. And then wouldn't an amoeba shell be like infinitesimally small? Yeah, they're super small. They like collect all together into big piles. So you can, I had a roommate in college who studied foram fossils. But you could be out in the world and see one. You would usually see a bunch okay. all at once. Yes. Okay, okay. I feel like pictures I've seen, they're like sand on a beach almost. You just yeah. find wow. like a pile of them. Hmm. That doesn't sound jewelryable to me, but I guess you could roll the mummy in it, you know, get them nice and coated up. <laughs> I think that they're, the idea is that uh, it's like, uh, imagine like glitter paint situation. Oh. Where you like put the paint on yeah. and then you put the, and then it's like. Then the, blow it off. The <sighs> Right. Okay, okay. (laughs) Yeah, exactly like that. I love the idea of Snail Snap. Yeah. I want to be on there instead of other social media. I'll trade it all. I'll trade all my 5,000 Twitter followers for snail pictures. Do you need a special app for the snails, though? Couldn't you just tell your friends to send you pictures of snails? There are a lot of these apps already that 
that there do, are. That sort of do citizen science stuff. Oh, okay. They're like bird. Plug into an existing thing. I haven't made any progress so far. You're shooting down all my ideas. <laughs> well, what do you think about exoplanets? I think that's wrong because I think that when I was searching for a fact for this episode, I saw another kind of exoplanet named after another kind of shell that this one is a is a... Uh, embellishment of that's very metagamey of you well it's an, i've saw it i saw metagamey it was a lived <laughs> experience i guess this is this is your science self you now know a thing and that's a different shell planet exists yeah i think i'm gonna go with the the shelfies the snail snap app because i don't know where foraminifera fossils are i feel like i've seen them by the ocean like, I haven't personally seen them. I've seen pictures of them or read about them by the ocean. So I think the Snail Snap app is the most likely of these three. Is Egypt not by the ocean in some places? Well, it's oh, got no. a lot of ocean. Okay, wait, cut go that, that out. One. That's very embarrassing for me. <laughs> no, no. No, no. I'm gonna go with I'm gonna go with the foram foraminifera one. Cause I think that just is like evo- evoking an image in my head of a big of a bedazzled mummy. And I'm going to go with the snail snap app because I want it to exist. I want researchers to be like, hey, let's take colorful pictures of snails and understand where they're from. I'm leaving in that you don't know where the ocean is. I'm sorry. (laughs) (laughs) I ran here. (laughs) I am really bad at geography. I am Sarah Palin levels of bad at (laughs) geography. (laughs) Well, researchers in the Netherlands wanted to see if they could develop a citizen science method to study evolutionary what? change in urban centers, and thus snail could snap was mummies. born. Damn. It's real. <laughs> snail snap is real. Uh, it is linked to an existing Dutch citizen science platform called mm, something in Dutch. Uh, the users <laughs> have to upload <laughs> pictures that they found. But they didn't need to add any data. The app was downloaded over a thousand times and received almost 10,000 images of the particular snail they were trying to study. And after removing certain pictures that couldn't be categorized, they had uh, like maybe almost 8,000. And they could sort that by habitat type and shell color. And they found that shells in urban environments were more likely to be yellow. Snails in non-urban were more likely to be pink. And that supports the results of experimental work that's shown that yellow snail, yellow shelled snails seem to survive better <laughs> in hotter temperatures and pink have a higher body temperature compared to the yellow snails. One possible explanation is the yellow shells are able to just reflect back more solar radiation and that keeps them cooler, like wearing a white shirt on a hot day. Huh. Good job, guys. Everybody wait, yeah. work together to find out things about shells. And Sam, you were absolutely right about eggshell planets. Um, so that there is a, a rare type of planet called an eggshell planet that has a uh, thin crust uh, that's super brittle, no mountains, no plate tectonics. And uh, scientists described a method to use a planet's size and age and distance from its star to identify whether it is an eggshell planet as those factors uh, impact the thickness of the planet's lithosphere. Hmm. There is also apparently a list of almost 3,000 nearby exoplanets fitting certain parameters that was published in 2014. And the list is called Conch Shell, which stands for Catalog of Nearby Cool Host Stars for Habitable Exoplanets and Life. Great. That's a good one. (laughs) And I promise you, you will not be able to find all of the necessary letters, but they have found them somewhere. (laughs) I know astronomers sometimes do a little stretch. That one is a a doozy. I would say. (laughs) A lot of extra letters. They got kind of part of the way there. (laughs) Then they were like, oh, well. This is too fun not to do. So that leaves Sari with one point and Sam with nothing. Next, we're gonna take a short break. Then we'll be back with a fact off. SciShow Tangents is brought to you by Rocket Money, a personal finance app that finds and cancels your unwanted subscriptions, monitors your spending, and helps you lower your bills all in one place. Does this sound familiar? You want to watch the 1987 animated film, We're Back, A Dinosaur Story, but you can't find it on any of the normal streaming services. So you do a little sleuthing and you find that We're Back, A Dinosaur Story is only available on Bing Bong, an extremely dodgy app that looks like crap and costs 10 bucks a month. But you really want to watch We're Back, A Dinosaur Story, so you sign up telling yourself that you'll 
you'll cancel the subscription right after you watch the movie. But then you fall asleep halfway through, and by the time you wake up, any notion of canceling Bing Bong has disappeared from your mind. So you go about your life until several years later, your significant other is looking over your credit card statements and asks, what the heck is Bing Bong and why are we paying them $10 a month? You shrug, not fully grasping that you have sent Bing Bong several hundred dollars of your hard-earned money so that you could watch half of We're Back, A Dinosaur Story. If this has ever happened to you, you aren't alone. Over 80% of people have subscriptions that they forgot about and are wasting money on without even realizing it. But Rocket Money is here to help. Rocket Money will quickly and easily find your subscriptions for you, and for any that you don't want to pay anymore, just hit cancel and Rocket Money will cancel it for you. It's that easy, but that's not all. Rocket Money also helps you manage all your finances in one place and automatically categorize your expenses, so you can easily track your budget in real time and get alerted if anything looks off. Over 3 million people have used Rocket Money, saving the average person up to $720 a year. With those kind of savings, you could buy 65 Blu-rays of We're Back, A Dinosaur Story from Amazon. So stop throwing your money away, cancel and wanted subscriptions and manage your expenses the easy way by going to rocketmoney.com slash tangents. That's rocketmoney.com slash tangents, rocketmoney.com slash tangents. All right, everybody, get ready for the fact off. Our panelists have all brought science facts to present in an attempt to blow my mind. And after they've presented their facts, I will judge them and I'll award them with Hank Bucks any way I see fit. But to decide who goes first, I have a trivia question for you. So the Nautilus, you've heard of it. It's a cephalopod with an external shell, and you may have seen it used over and over again as an example of the golden ratio at work. And according to this idea, the Nautilus shell forms that golden ratio spiral, means that with each quarter turn, the spiral gets wider by a factor of five, which is approximately 1.618. But does it? In 2005, a mathematician was like, I don't think it does, and got some shells at the California Academy of Sciences and found that the ratio was 1.33. And then a feud began, and an art professor was like, you didn't look at very many shells. I'm going to look at more shells than you. And he worked with the, the Smithsonian National Museum of Natural History to get a bunch of different shells. How many shells did this guy in his uh, in, in his feud, <laughs> it's not a feud. I'm sure they got along fine. But anyway, how many <laughs> shells did he measure? Wow, the gold that being the golden ratio is the only thing I know about anything. I know it's very it's specifically the golden ratio. I don't know. We're about to find out. He's going to measure more shells, and at the end of the, the when you guess, we're going to find out. It's going to be great. Okay, okay, okay. He measured. Gosh, professors are probably so stubborn. He probably measured eight hundred shells. He probably measured a thousand shells. shells. I changed it a to thousand a thousand. Shells. <laughs> I think I think he measured like seven hundred shells. Yeah, you don't think he measured a thousand shells? Not quite. Sari is our winner because it was only eighty, which was still a what? lot more oh. than the other guy measured. What a quitter! <laughs> I know he might still be having <laughs> big talk to be like eighty. <laughs> All of that, and he measured eighty. And at the end of at the end of that, he measured eighty, and his was even smaller. The average ratio was one point three one. No, <laughs> the golden ratio as a. I guess it's not a lie, but yeah, the golden ratio continues to be real. But uh, <laughs> this is not an example of it. None of the species that he looked at matched the golden ratio. Uh, the ratio spirals of the crusty nautilus were about 1.365, which is a roughly four to three ratio, which is a close approximation of the meta golden ratio. In Ugh. Bartlett's words, quote, it cool. is a pleasing mathematical number with notable generative geometric properties, just as the golden ratio. So nice he's like, this try, one's bud. also good. <laughs> this is very close. This is one of the saddest things I've learned on SciShow Tangents. I hate this. <laughs> it's wild. It's the Nautilus is the thing you see. Yes, it's the only thing you see, basically. Well, I think like there's like that cauliflower, that like fancy cauliflower. Yes. It's got that golden ratio going That's on. That's true. That's true. I bet that doesn't either. I bet some scientist is like, no, no one even checked. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love that no one checked. Like finally, <laughs> someone was just like, but I don't know that. Like I looked at a picture and it doesn't really line up. <laughs> All right, Sarah, that means you get to go first. Today, I would like to introduce to you the crabattery. A battery made with crab shells. <laughs> <laughs> this name is no, me editorializing not. because is this a I want to fail because it's not this one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is me editorializing because okay. I want to have fun. I'm not a coward. 
uh, like these scientists. <laughs> but the uh-huh. battery in question is more broadly made with uh, chitosan, which is m- a more water soluble derivative of chitin, which is a structural polysaccharide in crustacean shells, but also fungi and insects. And the basic structure of any battery is that there is a positively charged terminal called the cathode, a negatively charged terminal called the anode. And then some stuff in between to help electrons move around. The stuff, Mm -hmm. which is called an electrolyte, can be a liquid, a paste, or a gel. Or a crab. Or a crab. (laughs) Uh, Well, a derivative of a crab shell. Uh, (laughs) And in a lithium ion battery, there's a liquid electrolyte that helps lithium ions move between the two ends. But in a crab battery, uh, (laughs) there is a firm gel electrolyte made with chitosan that helps zinc ions move between the two ends. My understanding is that zinc ions have been trickier to work with in general in batteries because they tend to clump up in a liquid electrolyte and form little growths called dendrites that can short circuit the battery if they get big enough. But this chitosan gel actually stabilizes the zinc enough to prevent this problem. And according to a 2022 study from the researchers that created it, the crab battery is 99.7% energy efficient after 1,000 battery cycles. And I think mm-hmm. that's on par with many battery goals. Hank is nodding and he's done more eco-tech research that's than me. Uh, he's the eco-geek w- himself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the hashtag eco-geek. But just to give everyone else some context, from what I could find, batteries kind of run the gamut of trying to stay more than 80% efficient for anywhere from 500 to, like, in the extreme cases, 9,000 cycles, depending on what I read. And on top of that, this crab shell infused electrolyte gel is also biodegradable. When the team took the gel, buried it in soil, uh, microbes broke it down over the course of around five months because they can break down chitosan and zinc is relatively non-toxic, which isn't the case for many batteries out there that need to be specially disposed because they contain amounts of toxic metals. And of course, with research like this, it's hard to tell exactly what's going to be mass produced out of it. But the fact that it exists And researchers are experimenting with turning crab shells into all kinds of batteries. I found another group after this that are working on making crab carbon anodes uh, for a different kind of battery. (laughs) These crabs better watch their asses. We're after all. Yeah, right? (laughs) We're after (laughs) am. Like I'm looking at these pictures and it's also kind of making me a little hungry. Yeah, (laughs) crab gel (laughs) sounds delicious. You got too much to (laughs) offer us. Yeah, you got the meat, you got the electrical engineering, you got everything. (laughs) But yeah, it's a fun way to talk about electrical engineering and use the waste products when you eat those big old crab legs. Instead of tossing them, turn them into batteries. Yeah. Put it in the gas tank of your car and you can drive for yeah. miles. <laughs> I, love the, I love the idea that people who run crab restaurants are just going to have a, this like tremendous new income stream. <laughs> They'll be the richest mm-hmm. people in society. Uh, suddenly it's like, why is this place so cheap? And it's like, no, it's just, <laughs> we're really just a... Uh, just a house for crab shells. Yeah, crab, crab, crab battery. battery. Do they call it a crab battery? No, no that was made all that me. up because she's a genius. I just wanted to add some. They call yeah, it a Gerwin Riley. <laughs> 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 they call it a sustainable chitosan zinc electrolyte for high rate zinc metal batteries. I just feel like some some days I feel like the the world that we inhabit is just so technologically advanced, and some days I feel like it is just. So far behind. Does the crab battery make you feel advanced or like we're making batteries out of crabs? It's, it's like, it makes me feel like in the future, batteries are going to be really amazing. Okay. And actually right now, all these amazing batteries that we think we have are terrible. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. All right, Sam, what do you got for us? Hey, I don't think we can do an episode about shells without talking about one of the unofficial mascots of SciShow Tangents, hermit crabs. Hermit crabs, as we all know, are cute, weird little crustaceans that have evolved to squeeze their weird butts into discarded mollusk shells, and accordingly, their whole lives revolve around these shells, finding new ones when they get too big, trading shells with other hermit crabs, fighting other crabs for the shells, and fittingly, a lot of their brain space is devoted to being able to tell when one shell is better than another. They touch the shells, they weigh the shells, they check them for damage, and then they compare those like new shells to the shells that they're currently living in so they can make the decision about which one's better so that they can live their best little hermit crab lives. So, you know, it'd be really sad and sucky if there was something that hindered their ability to select the best shell, especially if it were something ultimately caused by humans being humans. Well. Yeah. 
In a 2020 study, a team of researchers studying the effects of microplastics on ocean life exposed a tank of hermit crabs collected from a beach in Ireland to microplastics for five days. They then removed the hermit crabs from their shells and put them in new shells that were 50% too small for them. After a couple hours of acclimating to their new bad shells, they were placed in a tank mere centimeters away from a new perfectly sized shell. And compared to a control tank of crabs not exposed to microplastics, the plastic exposed crabs were less likely to investigate the perfect shell and then when they did check it out they were less likely to trade it in for their crummy too small shell even after investigating it for like as long as the control crabs were investigating the perfect shells that they ended up moving into and a related study pitted hermit crabs against each other to fight over shells and found that plastic exposed hermit crabs were slower and had less energy than non-plastic exposed crabs. So the researchers concluded that something about the microplastic exposure was hindering their ability to assess the shells, but it's not really clear totally how. So it could be something like damage to the brain, but other studies on crustaceans and microplastics have shown that they induce feelings of false satiation in crustaceans Mm. so that they don't eat as much and they don't have as much energy to spend on searching out a new shell, maybe is one of the thoughts. Uh, And the hermit crabs weren't seen eating the plastic either. So it's just like being near microplastic is messing up. Poor little hermit crabs. So in conclusion, (sighs) mankind has gone too far this time. We can't hurt those guys. This isn't good because I spend so much time around but all kinds of like macro and microplastic. I yeah uh, everywhere yeah. And if it's if it's making it so that crabs can't make good decisions, I definitely am not making good decisions. Oh, that's a good point. I didn't even think about that. But yes, <laughs> probably. <laughs> Maybe they they can make fine decisions. They just feel fine. It's just like a anti anxiety for them. They're like hey, that's what it's I thought. Not a great shell, first. but it's good enough. Yeah, feelings of satiation. It's like ah, eh, whatever. I'm doing all yeah. right. I'm giving them a little ennui. They're probably feeling ennui just from my <laughs> personal experience because that's uh-huh. like the main emotion. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> so it's either going to be the crabattery or the microplastics making poor innocent hermit crabs worse at picking out shells. I am, I don't know. I don't want to be sad. And also I was a little <laughs> bit more astounded by the crabattery. So I think uh, I'm going yeah. crabattery. That's fine. We all love the crabattery, crabattery, don't we? But I do also love hermit crabs. I also love to be reminded that our unofficial mascot, after all of these years, remains yeah. hermit crabs. Yeah, I, I kind of forgotten about them myself. And that means that Sari is the winner of our episode with some amount of Hank bucks. Mm-hmm. And also it means that it's time to... <laughs> <laughs> Two whole, I ran for those Hank bucks. <laughs> Worth it. <laughs> and now it's time to ask the science couch where we've got a listener question for our couch of finely honed scientific minds. At Azarine Tweets asks, why do so many shells spiral rather than being built straight? Hmm. Ooh. Our hair and fingernails I mean, are straight, I mean, I definitely, like, I could usually say something, but I, I can hmm. say nothing. All I can say is that there are two pieces to it. There's how it gets done, and there's why it gets done. And I don't know either. <laughs> and I can do half. <laughs> you can do half. Maybe it's like there's an advantage to having like the internal, <laughs> the, like the internal structure of a spiral thing makes it Maybe. really strong. Sari can only do half. Which half? I can do the how, not the why. <laughs> no <laughs> idea. We don't know. <laughs> Sam don't offers know. A, a, a guess at why, and then Sari's yes. got a how for us. Yes. Well, because the why... It's like they're also, especially when you get into the intricate ones, like the Venus combs and the conch shells and things like that, that have all these protrusions on them in addition to Mm -hmm. the spiral. Like they look like art, but also why did they adapt to make those shapes so particular? So the way that these shells get made is they're secreted over time, which I think is a weird Mm -hmm. thing to think about because if you're like a shell is a house. Um, mm-hmm. shouldn't it just exist? It doesn't just exist. And it, it gets secreted over time and grows with the organism. Um, and that's how, in general, the spiral gets made. So the shell uh, material is secreted by a kind of tissue on mollusks called the mantle, um, which is in contact with the shell and located just like under the, the lip of it. And the two things that it mainly secretes are proteins, which add the structure of the the shell, kind of like a steel rebar that you lay down in a building foundation. And then Mm -hmm. it excretes minerals, usually some form of calcium carbonate. 
um, that creates everything else in the shell, like, like pouring concrete in. That creates most of the structure. The way that these shells are secreted, as far as we can tell, like the why is a question mark, but it is some sort of like neural network, genetic switches. For example, in one species of snail, um, scientists have isolated a single gene that if you turn it on or off, it changes the the direction of the spiral on a snail. Um, Mm. So like there are very, very precise mechanisms in place that Mm -hmm. cause the secretion to progress in a certain way that makes a very precise spiral pattern. But the three factors that affect uh, the way that a shell takes place is the way that the shell expands over time. So they start by secreting just a tiny, tiny bit and gradually secrete more and more and more to make the mouth of the shell wider and wider to fit their current body size. And as the organism grows, um, it expands the size of the shell. The second bit of it is rotation. So by depositing slightly more mineral and proteins on one side than the other, that's what makes Mm -hmm. the shell grow and start to spiral in a direction. Um, And then the third rule is also sounds like rotation, but it's a, it's like a twist. So you can, in addition to depositing more material on one side than the other, you can change at what points you deposit material. And I think that twist movement is also what causes those spikes where you could just have Mm. like an extreme deposit all at once and then stop and then twist and then extreme deposit at different points in the mantle. And all like those three factors of secreted mostly calcium carbonate and a little tiny bit of protein um, in mathematical models can make all kinds of different spiral shaped shells. I don't animate. So I don't know if this is going to be a bad metaphor. Maybe Sam, you can step in, but (laughs) it's like an animate. I don't know. You like squash and stretch in different directions and you can make all kinds of different shapes. Or if you were like squeezing Play-Doh through a tube, Mm -hmm. if you just like manipulate little bits of the way that it's coming out, then the shape itself will completely change. Right. It seems like it would be too much work to have a shell. I'm happy to be squishy all over. You got to (laughs) evolutionarily invest in it. They put a lot of points into Mm-hmm. I gotta be protected. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> then they're just sometimes a little blob otherwise. They mm-hmm. min-max themselves into blobbiness. I kind of have a hard time, and I apologize to the mollusks for this. If they're always inside of a shell, I don't really think of you as an animal. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think of them as? I mean, I think I mean I know like they are animals, but like that's not what my mind they're just like goop. They're like a animatronic just rock at that point. Just yeah. a little decoration. <laughs> Ah, <laughs> thanks, Sam, for saving me. Yeah. <laughs> Sari, at that point, they're just like an animatronic rock. <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> but if they've got a bunch of tentacles and eyes and stuff, then I'm like, that's a, yeah. Yeah. Barnacles, mm-hmm. I feel the same way. I'm like, that's not a thing. <laughs> no way. You just don't like the goops. I want the animal. Yeah, I want, I want to see some more differentiation of shapes. <laughs> Hank makes a hard stance on cellular differentiation. Yeah. Not good enough. Not enough cell mm-hmm. types. Not not a cool creature. Look, I want if, if you want me to think that you're an animal, I want your shell to open up and for a little face to pop out. Oh, a guy. It's like, 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 hey, hey here's my eyes and my mouth <laughs> smiling at you. <laughs> That's that works for me. Yeah. Even None if, of this. Even if like, the mouth is like terrible and tucked in amongst all the tentacles, I'm yeah. still like, that counts. You want the clam to come up to you and go, hello, Hank. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then it can be yeah, an animal. I, I need Jim Henson to get involved and then, uh, <laughs> then I can count you as a real live animal. Yeah. <laughs> if you want to ask the Science Couch your question, you can follow us on Twitter at SciShow Tangents, where we'll tweet out topics for upcoming episodes every week. Or you can join the SciShow Tangents Patreon and ask us on our Discord. Thank you to at Bear Stravaganza on Twitter, Chris on Discord, and everybody else who asked us your questions for this episode. If you like this show and you want to help us out, it's really easy to do that. You can go to patreon.com slash SciShow Tangents to become a patron and get access to things like our newsletter and our bonus episodes. And also special thanks to our patron, Les Aker. And don't forget, once we hit 700 patrons, we're going to do that Minions movie commentary. Sam, where are we? As of June 13th. 2023. 
647 patrons. I think that's the same exact place we were last time. Guys, tell your parents. If each of you tells your parents, we could easily (laughs) triple this number, I think. Yeah, you know, parents don't love anything more than minions. And you just can, like, (gasps) mumble the piss part. You say, oh, man, mom, you love a minion, right? My favorite podcast, SciShow Tangents, is going to talk about minions next. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) So please support them. Yeah, and your mom has a Minions t-shirt on. This episode is released, and then she says, oh, my. But at least she gave us her money for a little while first. (laughs) That's right. (laughs) So go to subscribe. We are tantalizingly close to discovering exactly how much piss a Minion can really hold. Second, you can leave us a review wherever you listen. That's helpful. It, it helps us know what you like about the show and also helps other people know uh, what you like about the show. And finally, if you want to share your love for SciShow Tangents, just tell, tell people, people about, about us. us. Thank you for joining us. I've been Hank Green. I've been Sari Riley. And I've been Sam Schultz. SciShow Tangents is created by all of us and produced by Sam Schultz. Our associate producer is Eve Schmidt. Our editor is Seth Glixman. Our story editor is Alex Billow. Our social media organizer is Julia Buzz Bazayo. Our editorial assistant is Deboki Trakravarti. Our sound design is by Joseph Tuna Medish. Our executive producers are Nicole Sweeney and me, Hank Green. And of course, we couldn't make any of this without our patrons on Patreon. Thank you. And remember... The mind is not a vessel to be filled, but a fire to be lighted. But one more thing. Clams and other bivalves have two fleshy tubes called siphons, one for inhaling water and one for exhaling water. And typically, they also expel poop out the exhalant siphon to get it away from their bodies. Oh, huh. But one wood-eating bivalve called Xylophaga dorsalis has such a short exhalant siphon that its poop piles up to form a fecal chimney in and around their shells, which is exactly as gross and confusing as it sounds. Uh, <laughs> this woody poop tunnel restricts the flow of water, which feels like a huge liability. In a 20. 20- 22 paper, though, researchers suggested that because these bivalves cluster in dense groups and can tolerate low oxygen levels, their fecal chimneys might help them outcompete other wood eating organisms. Oh. We still don't know exactly, but there has to be a reason they're piled in poop. Yeah, it does there. Like... Yeah, I don't know. Just an accident. They just evolved so poorly. Well, if it's, <laughs> you know, if it's not doing any harm, it sticks around. But I am glad to know about fecal chimneys just because it's a fantastic couple of words to end up (laughs) together. (laughs) Do they get presents from Santa? (laughs) 